Um, welcome everyone to uh, the now fourth meeting of Jane Family Institute's Social Wealth Seminar, um, which is an ongoing virtual semi-monthly forum exploring strategies to manage public assets and resources in service of a more just society in the United States and across the world. Um, and as um, many of you um, know by this point, uh, the idea is that this should be um, a forum that continues um, really indefinitely. Um, so uh, at the outset today, as always, um, I'd invite you, if you have any ideas about people you'd like to see present, uh, please do share them with me. Um, so who am I? Um, my name is Paul Katz. I'm uh, Vice President for Special Projects at JFI. Uh, the Jane Family Institute is an applied research organization in the social sciences, and we focus on three uh, principal areas of research, uh, guaranteed income, uh, digital ethics, and higher education financing. Uh, so uh, for today's session of the Social Wealth Seminar, um, we are uh, really lucky uh, to be learning from Carla Santos Scandier, and I will introduce her uh, and her topic in just a moment. Uh, but first, um, I'd love to very quickly preview um, the sessions that we have programmed for next month. Uh, so on Tuesday, September 1st at 10 a.m., uh, we'll be hearing from Raul Basu, who is the research director of the Goa Foundation. Uh, he'll be speaking about uh, the mineral wealth of nations accounting for the resource curse. Uh, and then uh, two weeks later, uh, on Tuesday, September 15th, uh, at our regular time of 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, we'll be hearing from Marcelo Medeiros, uh, who's a professor at the University of Brasilia. Um, he'll be speaking about his proposal um, for a, a new system of social protection in Latin America entitled Beyond Formal Workers, Expanding Social Protection in Latin America. Uh, we're really excited about these two sessions, uh, in part because uh, we have been looking so heavily at the U.S., and this is really going to be, I think, an opportunity in September um, to expand uh, the ambit. Um, just a quick note about format. Uh, we'll be saving lots of time um, following Carla's presentation of about 25 or 30 minutes uh, for questions and discussion. Um, so uh, we'd ask you to please hold off uh, during the presentation, save those uh, for what follows. Uh, but if you do have points of clarification you'd like to raise, please just put them in the chat um, and we can all see them there. Um, I'll also note that we are recording this session and we'll be posting a lightly edited version to our YouTube channel uh, for those who can't make it. So if you prefer uh, not to appear, uh, please have your camera off and you know, uh, just type whatever you'd like into the chat uh, rather than asking it out loud. Um, so a last quick thing to do before introducing our speaker is just to thank, uh, as always, uh, several people. First, JFI's editorial department, Molly Dektar, Jack Gross, Maya Adarith, and especially Hala Ahmad, who's our PR lead and uh, has been instrumental to helping uh, formulate and coordinate the seminar. Uh, also, of course, uh, to those who presented so far and have agreed to in the future, uh, to Carla and to all of you for joining us. All right, um, so now uh, moving on to the substance uh, of the day, uh, we're going to be learning today uh, from Carla Santos Scandier uh, on non-extractive finance mechanisms for a just recovery and transition. Uh, Carla is the co-manager of the Climate and Energy Program in the Next System Project at the Democracy Collaborative. Her work fo focuses on addressing climate change through systemic solutions. She has a background in international environmental law, climate change, renewable energy, and sustainable development, particularly in developing countries such as Brazil and China. She joined the Democracy Collaborative as a research associate with the Next System Project in 2015. She is a Brazilian attorney and, her, and holds an LLM in energy law and policy certificate, uh, I'm sorry, in energy law and policy and a certificate in climate law from the Vermont Law School. During her time as a Global Energy Fellow at the Institute for Energy and the Environment, she worked with Vermont communities as they aimed to develop renewable energy projects to provide community self-sufficiency and economic development. So thank you so much, uh, Carla, for joining us. And now I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for everyone that is joining uh, today at 6 p.m. And I um, and for Jen Family Institution for actually inviting me. Uh, I don't know if you guys watched the ones that the past set webinars, 
uh, I think they're worth while watching they're in the YouTube channel I learned a lot and there's a lot of intersection with what I'm gonna talk today trying not to be redundant uh, and just seeing how all the pieces fit uh, so as Paul mentioned uh, I am a Brazilian environmental attorney who's been working in the U.S. for the past almost nine years um, and talking about financial, financial mechanisms. Uh, I came from a climate angle and for the past three years or so, I actually been learning about financial mechanisms because there was a huge gap um, connecting the two fights, uh, especially Occupy Wall Street and everything that we learned in 2008 and how we could leverage some of those financial tools to move forward and mitigate the climate uh, climate change. So I'll be talking a lot about that. Um, and just a little background for those who are not familiar with the Democracy Collaborative is a nonprofit organization. We like to call ourselves a think to tank because we do have a research department is strong in developing uh, systemic solutions and policy oriented as well. And we also have uh, on the ground uh, committed well building projects with municipalities and other uh, and cities to actually leverage uh, the power of communities to build their own wealth and distribute, especially for those that have been uh, disinvested for decades of, of the, our political system. Uh, so check it out the work, the Democracy Collaborative. It also has the Next System Project, project as Paul mentioned. So both websites are worth looking, especially if you're talking about wealth and equality and uh, systemic solutions moving forward. So I'm going to try to share my presentation. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Just. I believe so. Okay. I'm going to try to share my presentation. Um, in case. Um, okay. If I do this slideshow, okay, okay, it works. Um, Indeed. Oh, so, yeah, so I'm here talking today about no extractive finance mechanism for a just recovering transition. I think a good way to start, uh, I always assume that people know what I'm talking about, but in case you don't know what I'm talking about, um, let's start with extractivism. And, and what I consider extractivism is basically the practice of extracting as much as possible at the lowest cost and the greatest profit for a single individual or entity. Um, basically, the idea surrounding that you're just reducing resources, natural resources, but also labor and people to a commodity status at best. And here I say at best because as I think the current crisis has shown, there are people that don't even fall within the commodity status, like care workers. Uh, and they are not even being represented by our financial uh, system and our economy. So there is even an additional layer of that. Uh, it's bad to be commodity, but it's even worse in a, in a society as a strong base in financial system as ours to not even be considered a commodity as sometimes. Um, so I think it's pretty clear the way uh, extractivism works in the energy sector, especially since our energy sector is based on fossil fuels. So it's basically the idea that we are extracting uh, resources and communities and labors and actually externalizing a lot of the costs while single um, and profit-driven corporations that actually pocketing much of, much of the, pro the profits nowadays. Uh, so I think you all understand where I'm coming from in the climate um, space because this is usually where people mention extractivism in the first place. But, that, but the reality is that extractivism materialized in several pieces of our system. And that, all, that includes also in our political system, but it's also included in our finance system that for many years have been underserving communities and individuals that are considered just too high to even be, um, be offered financial service. And even when they are served, they are served on the predatory conditions. And this is just basically, the basic idea is like if you're serving uh, a community that is rated a D minus just because it's a low income community, usually the loans are gonna make on a high interest rate and short term loan. And basically, 
most of the time living in the bar in a worse condition than when they first uh, came to jump into the service. So this, and I always like to share this cartoon. It's an old cartoon. Uh, it's by Tom Toro. It was in the New York Times a while back. But basically, this is a representation of our financial system. Uh, we are destroying our planet. We are destroying our communities. Uh, we are destroying some people's lives, but we are creating a lot of value for shareholders. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, but <laughs> this is not what I think that a human-made uh, system should be designed and work for. Um, so what is the other way? There's actually a non-extractive finance. Um, and here I'm just uh, kind of quoting Corporation Buffalo. If you don't know this organization, it's grassroots organization that it actually provides lending and non-extractive finance lending to individuals and some worker cooperatives. And the idea is that actually nobody owns wealth, wealth to the invention of society. And for those individuals that actually have extra wealth, they should be lending those to those that don't have wealth so they can create wealth and you only pay back if there is a surplus and if actually you are producing wealth and able to, to produce wealth on your own. Uh, otherwise, there is no reason why you should be paying back uh, for something that the other person didn't create in the first place. Um, Non-extractive finance, after I put this title together, usually is referred as regenerative finance as well. And it's just the idea that we need to shift control of capital to communities um, most affected by injustice and actually socialize, distribute, and repair the financial system that we have today that is discriminatory in many ways and extract uh, the resources so other ones can concentrate wealth in their own pockets. Um, so what are the principles of non-extractive finance? Basically, first, it should be building community wealth. It truly needs to ensure that wealth created through finance are kept largely by society, not financial institutions or single individuals. It needs to empower people. And the idea is that we need to shift control by democratizing money creation and allocation process. And I think this, the idea of empower people is not only empower people through income and wealth, but also to truly empower people in the sense that they can participate in the decision-making process along the ways and have their voice heard, something that uh, sometimes feels very different from reality. We also need to not only build wealth, but socialize the wealth that we already have. So we need to distribute wealth across so uh, the society, and this including not only maybe prioritizing service that actually advance equitable business models. And when I talk about that, it's basically models that are owned by the people that either consume, either work for the model, or is actually by the location where the business is set up. And that's usually community owned, for example, renewable projects or worker cooperatives uh, and so forth. And finally, and I think this is something that uh, the current social racial unrest that we are seeing across the United States in particular, we need to decolonize finance. Um, it, it, it has really, this past three months, have really put into my work a lot of uh, soul searching almost in not only creating an equitable system, but actually repair for decades of uh, redlining and historic discrimination groups, especially indigenous people and black um, African-Americans. So those are the four pillars of like a non-structive finance mechanism and basically moving past the, the system that we have today. As you're gonna see, well, I messed this up a little bit. I'm gonna put it all in there. So I came from a climate perspective. So for me, this is all related to a just transition. And now we also been related to a just recovery because unfortunately the COVID-19 crisis is um, putting a lot of money into the economy. Uh, and in some ways it is nice because it's exactly 
a lot of money that we need to do the just transition. And exactly in the decade that we need to do the just transition, we just need to align. But um, as you can see, all the pillars of the non-extractive finance uh, system also matches with what we consider just recover and transition, which through by building community wealth, we can actually create a system, uh, a, society, a society that is sustainable and resilient, not just to this, to the climate shock, but also to financial shocks. We can empower people uh, which enables the piece of democratic uh, transition and recovery. We can socialize wealth, which actually increase the piece of just recovery and transition around making a society more equitable. And by decolonizing financial systems, we also allow the reparative um, nature of the just transition to start uh, turning its wheels. So, as I mentioned before, uh, financial institutions are human-made uh, system that should be serving us, not the other way around. Uh, so we need to start aligning uh, back to the public interest. Um, so how that works. Uh, a lot of people, when they talk about financing the, the just transition, even before this crisis, they talk a lot about how we can leverage channel private capital for the transition. Uh, and that means, and the way that it's materialized is not that we are actually channeling private, um, private capital for just transition. We're actually allowing some green projects to get off the ground, but basically by socializing costs and privatizing profits, which is a totally different animal for a non-extractive finance system. So, I think if we are true about moving forward to a just transition system, we need to match that with a financial system that is truly done by and for the people. And fortunately, we have some tools already available today. And basically, the federal government, especially in the United States, I like to, to mention a little bit, I'm from, the, from Brazil, but I think different nations have different authorities and different powers regarding the currency, um, but especially the United States, the Bank of England and uh, the Central European Bank are three that I'm more familiar with, and this is kind of where my work intersects a little bit. They do have so much power into the financial system that they can create and allocate public money to the public interest with almost no negative into their whole economy. And this is actually what I'm going to be talking a little bit about. So I am focused on the federal level mostly, although anything that I say could actually replicate and should be replicated into the state and local level as well to apply the subsidiary uh, principle. But my focus of work is in the federal level, particularly in the Federal Reserve Bank. And I also wanted to say something about the just transition. So a lot of folks like to, to folks uh, focuses on the ramping up renewables as the piece of the just transition and green project, which is a much needed uh, piece of the just transition. And I think we do understand that we need more renewable capacity and energy efficiency uh, and we need it fast. But for me, it's not only a matter of increasing what is good, we also need to decrease what is bad. So I do come from a strong supply policy perspective, which means that we need to match ramping up the good with decreasing the bad. And that means that we need to find, a, find ways to decrease fossil fuel production in the United States. Um, ramping, ramping up renewable capacity and shifting demand is not enough to displace uh, fossil fuel production, especially at the pace and scale that we need today. So this is kind of the background that I want to give before jumping into some actual, um, practical solutions moving forward. So as I mentioned, we do have uh, in the United States and other, other countries, especially developed countries, a number of financial tool mechanisms that could be used today to mitigate the climate, climate crisis. The first one is the one that I've been working the most uh, and all of this that I'm going to mention is actually pre-COVID-19, and I'm going to talk about uh, the current crisis a little bit further. Um, but before the current crisis, I was actually 
revisiting what happened in 2008 and thinking about lessons learned. And I don't know if you guys know about quantitative easing, but it's, um, in a nutshell, it's basically the federal power to purchase financial assets by simply debiting its account and crediting the asset holder uh, account. Um, so instead, a lot of people think of money creation in the traditional way of printing money. Actually, this is not the reality in the 21st century. A lot of the money is created through computer keystrokes of debiting someone, uh, crediting someone account and debiting your own account and vice versa. Um, so under section 14 of the Federal Reserve Act, for those lawyers out there who like those uh, details, there is this uh, opportunity for the Fed to go into open market operations. Uh, and in 2008 was the first time that they actually did large, um, large scale market operations. And that is called quantitative easing because it was putting a lot of money into the economy, which accounts for the quantitative and easing because it was trying to ease the economy by injecting money into financial sector. Uh, so looking back what happened in 2008 and considering that we need to move fast uh, out of fossil fuel, our fossil fuel dependence, uh, and especially for those who are a little familiar, and it, it is in one of the readings, if you get curious about it, there is uh, an issue of a carbon bubble in our financial system. We saw a little bit of what that could happen in April when the prices of uh, oil went negative for the first time in history. So the idea is how we can ease our financial system without popping, popping a carbon bubble and at the same time securing uh, our fossil fuel reserves to ensure that they are in the ground and we can uh, secure a just transition for the independent workers and communities. And one of the idea was just for the Federal Reserve Act could go straight to the market um, by 51% or 100% of fossil fuel companies and secure their reserves into the public interest. That way it would allow not only to distress any potential carbon bubble and strain assets in our financial system, but also secure a pathway and kind of clear the pathway for the just transition that we need, not just for workers and communities, but also for our energy system and our political system, um, to be more specifically as well. Um, so for those don't believe that the Fed can create money out of thin air, this is the Fed spreadsheet. Uh, as you can see, before 2000 and around 2004 was less than a trillion. In 2008, when the crisis, uh, the Great Recession hit, it pumped around 3.5 trillions, uh, and the spreadsheet never actually went down. It was supposed to go down a little bit. They were starting to sell some assets years, but they put a stop. And now um, in the current crisis, they, they pump another three trillion so far. If I, it's, it's hard to keep up late with the numbers, but you can see now it's past seven trillion, the balance sheet of the Fed. Uh, so the Fed can create money and can solve some issues creating money as well. So other existing financial mechanisms, there was the emergency lending. As I mentioned, uh, my work was um, trying to create solutions for strain assets of the companies, not only the political system, but also in the financial system. So the Fed also has uh, emergency lending powers, basically under unusual circumstances like the one we are facing today, the Fed can, um, um, money into distressed fossil uh, companies. Uh, in the, usually it does into financial institutions, but as we saw in 2008, it also went beyond um, financial institutions. General Motors were, were one of the people, the companies that benefit from emergency lending in 2000, following 2008. And AIG actually was nationalized through this emergency lending too in 2008. Uh, although now has been privatized as well, the Fed did acquire equity on their emergency lending powers. And although they didn't exercise quite well the control of the company, they could have done so to lead General Motors to do green vehicles and, and take cars in case they wanted. Um, another financial mechanism that I 
talked in the past is just basically recognizing the fossil fuel companies, not only financial institutions, pose a systemic risk to our financial system. And that is basically understanding them as SIFI, which stands for um, systemically important financial institutions. In this case, we will need to actually broaden up the concept of what is uh, risky to our financial system. But once we can designate some companies as uh, SIFS, we can actually go through the process of resolving them. Uh, and this is a process that is fairly uh, now commonplace for financial institutions. So the government has a lot of powers and have used these powers in the past to either acquire equity, pump money, uh, and resolve companies that were putting a, a threat to the financial system. Uh, there's also a lot of set of new financial policies that could be implemented um, and will make our work a lot easier. Uh, first of all is one that I think everyone's been talking all around is basically recognizing climate related risk on the Fed's instability mandate. Um, Stability mandate. Uh, the Dodd Frank Act actually um, included a uh, stability mandate under Fed's authority. Uh, so now, along with price stability and uh, full employment, the Fed is also in charge of ensuring that the system is stable. And one of the risks uh, that have been identified by mostly all central banks around the world, if you look at the network for green the financial system, climate change is one of the top one risks to our financial system in the next decade. So if the Fed recognized that mandate, things can become really easy, uh, but I don't think the Fed needs to formally recognize or the, the Federal Reserve Act needs to be amended to do so. Uh, the Fed can also pursue other tools that other central banks are starting to do, including the Bank of England, such as a climate stress testing, just to understand how much of the regulated banks uh, are exposed to the issue of fossil fuel strain assets and starting to take measures to decrease the exposure. Uh, a lot of smart people have also proposed establishing green and dirty factors for reserve requirements and collaterals, basically encouraging green loans and discouraging uh, fossil fuel loans um, by making stronger um, or weaker reserve requirements and collaterals. There is also a proposal that my colleague at the Democracy Collaborative had been talking about, which is uh, allowing for the federal government to cancel that related to fossil fuels for rural electric co-ops. Co uh, and the idea behind that is that a lot of these co-ops attach to long-term contracts and debt to fossil fuel companies that require them to buy almost 90% of uh, coal generation capacity that have not allowed them to really invest in renewable energy and renewable energy generation. So if the Fed can cancel some of those contracts and debts that are really under uh, the federal entity, uh, mostly through the rural utility service, we can start kind of clearing the path for these rural electric co-ops co uh, to actually invest in distributed and renewable energy that are going to benefit not only the planet, but their own communities. And I think if we're going to talk about how fossil fuels are strain strengthening our straining, sorry, our financial system, we need to talk about potentially dislisting fossil fuel companies. It's not a crazy idea. Uh, others have proposed this, didn't come from me, but I think if we are true about and we start understanding how much of a threat some fossil fuel companies are putting in our current system, we need to start thinking of ways that we can take them out of financial system. As I mentioned, it's everything is human made, so, um, Sometimes the sky is the limit, although it doesn't feel that way. Um, another piece, and I think I'm running out of time, but I'll fly by. So, and I don't like to only talk about mechanisms and policies. I also like to talk about new financial institutions because I think there's many ways that the public and the federal government can leverage 
uh, its power to create money and allocate money in a democratic, sustainable, equitable way. Uh, I think there were some conversations in the past in this series about green investment banks or financial public financial institutions. So this is the idea that uh, democratic green investment bank that's federally owned could have a structure that is democratic, uh, governance, and accountable to communities to actually decide how to invest in just uh, transition projects. And that includes a green investment bank could also have an arm for holding equity and actually managing public uh, equity and investments in enterprises. So if we go to a nationalization route of fossil fuel company, this uh, investment bank could play a key role in actually being the vehicle which we do so. Uh, at the Democracy Collaborative, my colleagues have also developed this idea of a community ownership power administration, which is basically and hopefully building from rural electrification administration, which provided finance and capacity capacity for community run and renewable power electric utilities. Um, so there's other institutions that we can create that actually leverage more of this fi public finance power. And I also like to always mention that we need to democratize the Fed. I won't talk much about that, but uh, if you look, basically the Fed is a independent agency, uh, but it's actually owned by the banks that they regulated. <laughs> that it regulates, so we need to strain Fed's mandate to work in this, in, into the social, into its social mission. We also need to increase transparency, accountability, stakeholder participation, and reduce the role of private banks into the federal reserve as well. So those were all proposals before the crisis, and then the crisis hit, and I think one of the things that the crisis show is how our financial system is actually very extractive. So this is uh, a graphic from the Institute for Policy Studies that put every year a billionaire bonanza report that is worth looking, that puts a lot of things into perspective. And basically just in the uh, three first months of our pandemic, uh, 44 million people got unemployed, but actually billionaires have a 21% increase in their wealth uh, in the total amount of 637 billion. So this is exactly what we are talking when we talk about an extractive finance system. Um, and the fossil fuel uh, industry is not behind. For If you haven't been paying attention, they've been lo lobbying strongly uh, during the COVID relief package and they were able, able to lob as much to change a number of rules in the last minute to take advantage of four programs or four buckets under the stimulus package. One of the Main Street Lending Program, the Corporate Bond Program, program the Paycheck Protection Payment. They also <laughs> use that to pocket close to $4 billion. And they also were able to include some tax change uh, changes that are going to benefit them for the over the 10 years. Um, I can explain a little bit more if people have questions, but I'm just going to fly by for the interest of time. Um, so as I mentioned that, um, so this is a graphic from the energy policy tracker that is basically tracking stimulus money and where it's going to in the energy sector. Uh, and basically it already pumped uh, in the past months related to COVID almost a hundred billion dollars and three, three fourth of that amount went to support fossil fuel energy, mostly unconditionally. Uh, only one fourth went to support clean energy. And the issue is that the most money we inject to those companies, the, most we, the more we are locking infrastructure and emissions in exactly in the decade that we need to do is, you know, the opposite, going exactly in the opposite direction. Um, so in the past three months, in addition to all the other mechanisms that I talked before, we also been pushing back on what is happening in the stimulus packet of COVID. And uh, one of our main proposals, uh, especially if we're true about nationalizing those companies and take the reserves on our hands to keep in the ground and ensure just transition for workers and community is to, if there's money coming out, 
any stimulus funds needs to be based on equity and environmental standards. Um, polluters are not the ones that should be benefited. This is not a bailout. This is a way for us to secure uh, the control and clear the pathway moving forward, not to just um, basically to avoid, we don't want to go back to status quo, and I think everyone understands that, not only on an environmental perspective, but also on a social and equity pers perspective as well. Um, we also need to create a facility to deal with the long-term uh, recovery and transition. This is gonna take years, uh, the transition is gonna take decades, and we are due for a financial um, facility to deal with all of that. My proposal has always been something along the line on an infrastructure bank or investment bank that is federal owned and democratic organized. Um, right now, what we have in place is just last minute facilities that the Fed put together. Uh, the corporate bond program is actually run by a, managed by a facility whose the manage, uh, manager is BlackRock. Uh, we have raised a lot of issues uh, in the climate and um, movement. So it's past time and I think we could create that facility that we need not only now but for the years to come to manage all these programs. And there's also other opportunities and here I just uh, name one from allies, basically tap the Federal Reserve facility uh, for municipalities for transition initiatives. A lot of people are pointing that the mainstream program although it's almost half a trillion dollars uh, that have been appropriated for it. Uh, communities right now are not being able to tap, so they are estimating that close to, I think, 250 billion, so more than half are actually gonna be in the table by the end of the year. So we could um, start thinking along the lines how we can uh, leverage this money that's gonna be in the table and actually help municipalities to transition away from fossil fuel dependency. Um, okay, so I think that was a, my bird overview of all of the ideas that I've been talking about, and I love to hear questions, clarifications, um, food for thoughts for me. Well, thank you so much, Carla. Uh, this was really uh, such a, a pleasure to um, uh, to learn from you about uh, the great breadth of uh, issues and strategies that you've presented to us today. Uh, I'm especially uh, excited about the connection that you drew between uh, extractive finance in general and the financing of the extraction of uh, natural resources. And I, th I feel like these are kind of two things that we might you know, think of uh, using the same word, but without actually drawing the explicit connection. Uh, and so I, I, I really appreciated that uh, in, in particular. Um, so uh, I, I wonder, I'm sort of as always, um, it's uh, you know excellent to uh, kind of give others a chance to ask questions. I, I have some myself, but I'd love to um, to take just a couple minutes um, to let, or, or, or rather at least a, a couple seconds to let people gather their thoughts. And if you'd like to ask a question, uh, I'd ask that you please uh, put it in the public chat. Uh, you can just indicate that you have a question there, uh, and I'll be sure to call on you. Um, and, and Carla, may I ask, would you mind I'm just ending the screen share? Uh, it will kind of make it a little easier for me to manage everything on my screen. Uh, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so please share your question in the chat. Um, just a couple quick uh, directions. Um, you know, if you would like to ask your question yourself, uh, just indicate in the chat that you have one. I'll call on you. Um, and uh, then you know you can appear on video if you would like uh, or without it. Um, but please do introduce yourself um, and just tell us you know in a quick phrase who you are. Um, alternatively, if you would prefer not to appear in any capacity, uh, you can just put your question uh, in the chat in full, and I'll read it anonymously from there. Uh, because as a reminder, we are we are recording this. All right. So just a couple more seconds to see if anyone would like to to jump in here at the outset. Otherwise, I will continue to take the floor. Okay. Uh, well, Patrick Robbins, uh, you've uh, put yourself on the list. Uh, why don't you take, uh, take it away? And I think you're muted. Yes, got it now. Thank you. Um, 
thank you so much for this. Um, this is, is hugely insightful and, um, you know, been an admirer of the work of the Democracy Collaborative for some time. Um, thank you, Carla, for, for this presentation. Um, I am the uh, coordinator of the Energy Democracy Alliance in New York and a member of the Public Power Campaign um, being organized uh, through the statewide Public Power Coalition. And, you know, the proposals for things like a National Investment Administration and everything else, I think, have, um, you know, real obvious and clear um, uh, significance for, for the work that we're doing. Um, and I would love to hear some of your thoughts on how uh, some of this work happening at the federal level uh, can translate to both the physical and political infrastructure of the state level, you know, whether there would need to be like what kinds of interventions would need to happen, whether it would be um, filing, uh, you know, new uh, rate structures for utilities um, that are organized around uh, around equity, um, while we see some of the uh, potential price increases for fossil fuels, you know, happening, things like that, you know, I, I would, any, any thoughts on that connection with the state level, I would love to hear more about. Should I jump to answer? Oh, yes, please go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of design rating that needs to be done. Um, uh, in the past, I, were, I was into utility, and if in case you don't know, Johanna Bozua is my, the co-manager that works, uh, you know, uh, her work. So she will probably make that connection uh, strongly. Uh, I think in our perspective, the issue with the things that I've worked the most because of the Federal Reserve is that actually only the federal government has the power to create money and allocate money that simply. Um, we do advocate for public banks on state um, and local municipalities as a ways to channel and actually com uh, build communities. So I think a, a state bank would actually be um, if we can make the state government and municipal governments to actually use the bank as a depository, he could actually lend uh, loans to some community projects at lower interest rates and uh, longer terms. So there is ways that public banks can actually leverage uh, the creation of money through lending, but uh, truly just pouring down money, it can only come from the Federal Reserve. I do think that some we are seeing unique opportunities with what is happening, unfortunately, during the COVID crisis. And as I mentioned, a lot of people are actually paying attention to what, what is happening to the main street and the municipal, municipal liquidity facility and how much money is gonna be left on the table simply because communities cannot comply with the rules. It was not designed for communities. So people are trying to fix that and trying to see if there's some CDFIs in local communities or municipal banks, credit units can start facilitating that project, although it's a little more complicated. Um, so I think for those who read the Green New Deal, we don't talk about one public bank, we talk about a network of public banks. And actually um, the piece that I struggle the most is that it's very hard to advocate for a federal owned public bank, especially if I'm talking about dem democratic governance, without having models that can exemplify how that works in practice. Uh, people don't believe in democratic governments and federal institutions, especially because they don't see that even working in some communities and states. So I think we always advocated for our public ownership of utilities uh, and banks and, and other institutions that we could ramp up this idea. It needs to come from both sides, top and down. Um, so I think those are my thoughts. If you wanna go to the nitty gritty of rates and other ideas like debt cancellation and how to enable, I would love to connect you to Johanna who's been doing more of the state and local level energy democracy work than I've been doing. Thank you so much. Great, well, I think I'll, I'll jump in with, um, with a question of my own. Um, and I, I wanted to ask about stranded assets. Um, you know, I know this is a, a topic that um, some central banks are uh, investing a, a lot of uh, energy in. Uh, my, my sense, though I'm certainly uh, not an expert, is that the Fed has, has not been in the same way um, 
Uh, and I, I was just wondering, you know, are there um, groups in the United States that are, uh, as far as you know, kind of putting forward a vision for how to deal with stranded assets and specifically for how um, to devise like a stranded assets program that would distribute its benefits broadly? Yeah, so the Fed is late in the game and actually the United States in general, uh, a little late. Everyone understand, but the perspective is first we need to actually push policy that way before we have a strain asset. So it's kind of like the egg and chicken problem. People don't see a problem because we are so far from pushing fossil fuels uh, in that direction. Um, but there is a network and I think the last time I checked there was over 40 central banks that were part of that. They already released, I think, two major reports just saying that this is a problem is within central banks' mandates um, to deal head on. And they have really strong policy advice of how to move forward. The only issue is that right now is a lot of assessment. And I think we're past the point that assessing is the only solution. Um, so th there is a lot of ideas of how to deal with strain assets. I've been in um, conversations So the World Future Council, I think in Germany, have been putting some proposals that look very similar to my proposal and I've been in connection with them. I think we do, um, we do different ourselves because I don't, different from the debt cancellation of the rural cooperatives to clean the pathway because they are rural, they are owned by their own consumers. So that is a kind of different animal. Uh, some of the proposal is just injecting money into fossil fuel, fuel companies so they can actually transition away. The, the idea is that they cannot transition away right now because the fossil fuel model don't match the renewable model. So if you think a little bit on a business model, it's the same saying that, oh, you have a building so you can turn an ice cream, um, uh, ice cream shop into a restaurant and you can simply not. It's just a different oven. You don't need a bigger freezer. Uh, I don't know any of those business, but you understand like you need actually to change the business model. Uh, and that is a simple transition. Like if you think of renewables and fossil fuels, the way the business uh, are set up is way more complicated. So a lot of people think that it's just a matter of really injecting money, allowing them to break through and have a safe line for a little bit until they can start profiteering again from a renewable model. And I think in our perspective, um, we, I don't think there is a just transition under a centralized renewable energy system. Uh, this is truly an opportunity. Renewable by nature is dis distributed across the country and across communities, and is our better is the best chance. And I think the IPCC mentioned that uh, inequality and climate change go hand to hand. So addressing climate change, we need to address inequality as well. And this is truly our best chance. So we root a lot of our work into public ownership and everything that we do is just basically the idea that we need to shift ownership and control to actually shift, shift power. So this is how we root it. So I think we are unique in that sense that we try to attach everything. Um, other, as, as I mentioned, another idea is just this listing the, the fossil fuel companies all together from the financial market and then you don't have a strain assets because there's actually no value to materialize once you do that. Um, I'm trying to think other, e yeah, and I think in more of the traditional way, what people are trying is just to put shed light on the strain assets issue so they can start winning off, mainly like as your securities mature, you just start replacing with securities and other assets that are not fossil fuel driven. So this is how people are trying to just, um, uh, disclosure uh, mechanisms and I think Elizabeth Boring have very strong bills out there just to disclose to understand is the idea that we actually gonna be able to pass forward uh, the divestment movement around endowments and banks are also putting shed on these issues your your financial assets are gonna be strained either because climate change fiscal impacts or just transitions so there is always this theory around all this mechanism that we are seeing uh, I just don't think they are fast enough. And I think the idea when we were actually think about public ownership and quantitative easing, which is just a financial mechanism to pay for it, 
uh, we were just thinking ahead if the carbon bubble is to pop today, uh, looking what happened in 2008, who is gonna give the plan, the exit plan is actually gonna be the fossil fuel company because nobody's really thinking about it. So our idea was almost to have like this plan B insurance policy when everything uh, fall behind. And I think, unfortunately, we are not ready this year. We didn't, I truly thought it would be in this decade, but not in the first year of the decade. Um, so I think all the allies are learning a lot of lessons and we are having actually really good conversations and moving forward more ideas uh, around this. But we'll see. I think I haven't had the opportunity to stop and actually take a, a technical look at what this train assets uh, issue looks like now because we did see a preview in April of what could have looked like uh, if we were continue that path. So. No, great. Thank you. That's uh, that's uh, very interesting and, and, and much to reflect on. Uh, so I know that um, Leandro um, has a message that he has a question. Uh, Leandro, would you like to take the floor? Thank you, Paul. Uh, hey, Kyla. Good day. <laughs> Hello, everyone else. Uh, well, uh, you said you're, you've been following, especially the European Central Bank and the U.S. and uh, I guess the, the U.K. Central Bank, and uh, perhaps you you recall that in Brazil we do have these community banks movements now uh, that are now regulated by central bank it took like 15 years to get this way uh, but I would like to know if have you been uh, aware of anything any kind of regulation that uh, creates this kind of social honored uh, financial institutions like the community banks in Brazil uh, elsewhere uh, or if it's something uh, you don't only see here. Uh, I, I, there's a difference from this to the Grameen Bank, the well-known model of UNUS, because this is more like very social owned by communities here in Brazil, and we have more than a hundred of these working now, and they are based on fintechs uh, regulations nowadays. So uh, I'd like to know if have you been noticing something like that elsewhere? I think Paul can actually talk a little bit about that because he was the one who pointed to, I, I read his article and was mentioned some of these community banks in Brazil. Uh, I think in the United States, the closest that I can think is the CDFIs. They've been around this community development financial institutions. So they've been around. I don't know if they have the, exactly the same mechanisms of the community banks in Brazil, to be honest. Um, and there are two public bank, state-owned public banks in the United States that will be kind of similar, but um, one is the North Dakota Public Bank that's been around for more than 100 years, and another one I think was just established like four years ago is the Samoa uh, Public Bank. So those are the two that I can think that could be similar, but uh, I would need to understand more of the community banks in Brazil to know if they, yeah, if they create the same mechanisms or if they are the same animal because we use the same terminology, even in the investment bank, to mean very different things. A lot of people just think as a revolving fund, um, and another other people think, like me, is a money creation and a lending facility, but also equity holder. So, yeah, I would need to, but I, I'm gonna look and I came back to get back to you if I find anything. Thank you. And I, I should mention actually that Landro is the co-author of that article uh, from the Boston Review. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we would actually have, have talked extensively uh, about this. Yeah, but thank you. Um, so uh, we're now approaching seven, but I want to make sure that anyone who has a question and has not yet had the chance to ask it um, can jump in. So, uh, oh, and I see Steve Waldman has has raised his virtual hand. So please, Steve, take it. Um, hi, let me show up. Um, for, first, thank you for a great talk. I really enjoyed it. It was very, very provocative. Um, my, my question is going to be a little bit tangential, if, if you'll forgive that. But a couple of times you mentioned um, democratizing things, or dem democratizing the central bank and democratizing investment banks. Um, and um, your institutions are democracy collaborative. Um, in your response to Patrick, you, you, you sort of anticipated um, this question, which is that you pointed out that a lot of people are pretty skeptical of the idea of democracy at 
a federal level. So, I mean, the obvious way to say democratize the central bank would be to change its relationship with the government so that it's less independent of democratic politics and more independent of the banking sector. That would be one way to democratize it. But but there's a question: is is that really does that really constitute democratizing something in a meaningful way? And so I guess my my question, um, a little bit tangential to your talk, is in the in in that theme of trying to develop institutions and at the same time democratizing them um, in a sort of practical sense. How do you envision democratizing? Is it integrating it into the existing somewhat democratic state or is it something different than that? Uh, I think when I say about democratizing, it's actually bringing different stakeholders to the stakeholders to the table. So it's not only um, it's not only take advantage of the federal machine and the public system that we already have. It's actually creating a new system, and I think that's where we get a lot of pushback because there is no really uh, examples to point to. Although there are some uh, federal owned investment banks, including the the Costa Rica. Banco Popular, if people don't know, they should take a look on how it's work. It's actually owned by the people uh, that have their retirement funds in and the workers of Costa Rica. And they do have a number of assemblies and councils that actually ensure that representatives of each sector are heard. I think there's a long way to go, but um, we do put a release a paper last year about the Green Investment Bank on the, under the Next System Project uh, website that basically envisions some levels of the structured governance and mandates that help feeds into this democratization. So basically, my idea, there needs to be a social mission mandate uh, to make sure that um, all the investments and allocation decisions are actually driven by social mission and not just uh, mimicking private counterpart of profit maximization. Um, besides that, there is need to be a structure of transparency, accountability. People need to be able to, if they want, have access to public records and who uh, the bank is investing on, why is investing at what interest rate, uh, what is the decision uh, behind that. And I also think like we can not only rely on the board of directors, we also need to, in the paper, we talk about people's assembly, but other people have prefer other terminologies, but basically it's ensuring that along the sides with this board of director animals that have more of the technical structure and actually understand more of the financial system to make financial decisions. There's also this other uh, animal that is holding a stakeholder's interest uh, as a priority and they need to walk kind of hand in hand and guiding, guided by this people's assembly. So it, it is different structures and a lot of people don't see it, but there's a lot of examples around the world about like how to make it better. There's no perfect example, but uh, Costa Rica comes really close to being a, a good model to build from. Uh, I think Germany, also the Bank of Germany, used to have some good examples about governance uh, democratic governance, uh, even the England Investment Bank before they got privatized <laughs> was actually doing a good job because they, they had a strong environmental mandate. So uh, there is a long way, is a different animal from what we are used to, especially in the United States. But uh, as people are mentioned, they are bubbling up uh, on the grassroots level. And there are also example in the federal, just not, not yet in the United States that I'm aware of. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's a great talk. Great. Um, well, I wonder, I'm put out a, a last call for questions and see if anyone would like to ask one more. Uh, any, any takers? All right. Um, so uh, if it's all right, then I'm just going to ask, uh, sort of inspired by Steve's question, a last kind of closing inquiry, uh, which is, do you ever kind of see moments when uh, maybe uh, working against kind of extractive finance in general terms and uh, working against finance based on the extraction of fossil fuels might be at loggerheads, might be pushing in opposite directions. Do you, do you see any tensions between 
these two projects. And I, I think, for example, of uh, some some examples of um, petro nationalism, um, uh, especially in countries um, outside of the global north, as as maybe an example that could uh, introduce some tension in that relationship. Yeah, and for that, I recommend everyone to watch the next webinar of our resource course because this is also a thing that we talk when we talk about nationalizing. But in my view, I don't think there's a tension uh, at all because my when I think of an energy transition, I think about a just transition. I don't think we can land mitigate climate change without addressing uh, the equitable and reparative problems that we have to racial problems that we have today. I True thing, uh, and this is something that I clicked like probably two years ago when someone mentioned that climate change and social inequality are not problems. They're actually consequences of the same problem. So that kind of flips the coin because you're not trying to address climate and you're not trying to address uh, social uh, uh, injustice. We are actually trying to address something else, which I think is the economic, our political economy. So I think everything should have those lenses. Uh, for me, it's actually, I'm, I used to struggle with that, but I don't think that I contradict in the way that I see my work. But I, I do understand when people say it's contradict because in the end, we do need a lot of renewable and that might be centralized renewable as well. But at the same time, we need to start considering that uh, those are kind of, those are not our priority in a sense that we have this much money and we have so much potential in communities and other places that we need to invest that most of our focus should be on that and everything else is kind of ancillary instead of the other way around. So um, I don't know, I flipped that coin of problems versus consequences a while back and I, I, I struggle now to flip back, so. Uh, no, thank you, I, I like that metaphor too. Uh, I think for, for me, the coin still feels like it's, a, it's kind of in the air. Um, so I, I really appreciate that metaphor. Um, and, and also, I uh, appreciate your very kindly referencing uh, our next meeting of the Social Wealth Seminar, mm -hmm. which is uh, very generous to do. If you're interested in these questions, I actually think that um, you will be especially um, excited that we have two related, uh, I would say, seminars back to back. And that is that um, two weeks from now, as I mentioned before, um, on uh, Tuesday, September 1st at 10 a.m., Rahul Basu, who's the research director of the Goa Foundation, will be speaking about the mineral wealth of nations accounting for the resource curse. Uh, and actually, one other uh, quick event to note uh, that's coming up quite soon um, uh, is uh, that uh, Thea Rio Francos, um, who uh, has just published uh, a really intriguing new book um, called Resource Radicals, uh, will be uh, giving a book talk uh, at or through uh, virtually through JFI um, this coming Friday um, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, so I'll actually be sending that out over the seminar email list because I assume it will be of interest um, to many people on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it'd be wonderful to kind of continue um, this conversation there. Uh, but to, to close things up, I, I just want to reiterate um, how grateful we are to Carla Scandier for joining us today, uh, for offering, I think, this really broad, interesting, and quite provocative um, talk uh, and, and offering us, I think, a North Star um, for reorienting um, how we think about finance and extractivism uh, as we, we face uh, the, the kind of uh, hopefully not terminal challenge of climate change. Um, so thank you uh, once again, um, Carla, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks.